Welcome to the midweek Bible study for the First Christian Church in Galax, Virginia. I'm uh, Glenn Sage. I'm the interim pastor of the church. And uh, tonight I'm going to be conducting uh, a Bible study, which is uh, a part of a series of studies in the Gospel of John. And uh, we, week by week, we have uh, been walking through the uh, whole book of John, uh, verse by verse. And uh, these are all recorded on YouTube. So uh, uh, if you're interested in picking up on any of the previous uh, Bible studies that we've had on the Gospel of John, uh, you're certainly welcome to do this by uh, looking back, beginning with John 1.1. And tonight we're all the way up to the 13th chapter of John. And uh, we're going to be looking at uh, eight verses from the 13th chapter of John which is going to conclude our study with this, uh, uh, with this chapter. And uh, it begins with uh, verse 31 and continues through verse 38. And in verse uh, 31, uh, we uh, pick up on uh, the series of events that uh, took place in the upper room uh, where Jesus had retreated with his disciples on uh, what is called uh, Monday Thursday, which was called also the Feast of Preparation. Now, the Passover feast was going to be taking place the next evening. After uh, 6 o'clock in the evening, uh, the Sabbath would begin and uh, would continue until 6 o'clock then on Saturday evening. But uh, So there was a room that was prepared, and uh, Jesus and his disciples went there and everything was in readiness and uh, Jesus uh, first of all demonstrated uh, uh, humility to his disciples in the middle of uh, uh, of this time that they spent together. The scripture tells us uh, a little earlier that supper being ended Jesus laid aside his garments and he took a towel and he began to wash the disciples feet and he began to dry them and of course, this uh, repulsed Simon Peter. And he said, Lord, I'll never allow you to wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I wash, if I wash you not, uh, you will have no part with me. And so given that option, Simon Peter cried out and said, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. Uh, you know, I don't want to do anything that would lead me outside of the realms of the kingdom. And Jesus said, well, if I wash your feet, you're clean every whit. But you're not all clean because there's one person here that's going to betray me. And uh, so the disciples begin to look at one another, look at Jesus, and raise the question, Lord, is it I? And Jesus says, well, it's the person that dips a sop with me. When I reach into the bowl with a little piece of bread uh, to dip in this uh, in, in, in this gravy or broth, uh, that's the person that's going to betray me. Well, the disciples didn't understand uh, completely what Jesus was saying. And um, therefore, uh, when Judas did this simultaneously, as both Judas and Jesus reached their hand into the bowl, uh, Jesus says, uh, uh, go and do what you're going to do quickly. And Judas got up and he departed. So we pick up with uh, Judas's de departure from this upper room scene. He says, uh, therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus says, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. So Simon Peter is left the room, and um, the disciples were still wondering what Jesus was talking about, one of them betraying him. And Jesus began to talk about this act, this drama that was playing out, uh, was uh, now going to glorify Christ. And uh, God also was going to be glorified in the faithfulness of Jesus. And uh, we know that uh, much of the discussion, uh, or most of the uh, monologue, as far as we were able to hear, from the cross was Jesus addressing God. And uh, so they were together in this. 
And one of the things that was is going to take place as Christ is crucified is that for the first time in all eternity, I mean, God has been with Christ and they have been one. They've been unified in spirit and in mission. But uh, uh, in, in uh, the seven utterances from the cross, one of the most dramatic was when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In a moment of time, God turned his back on Christ. Jesus could not feel the fellowship of the Father. And the reason behind that is that in an instant of time, Jesus assumed the nature of sin for all humanity. Jesus accepted the responsibility for the sins of man that ever had been committed or ever would be committed. There have been uh, probably about, uh, it's estimated there's been about 6 billion people that have lived from the, from the time of Adam, from the beginning of humanity into our present time. And today there are 7 billion people living on the earth. There's more people living right now than has lived throughout all ages combined. And uh, so in that moment of time, Jesus accepted the responsibility and become a substitute for every sin that humanity had ever committed. What a weight this must have been for an innocent man to assume this. He'd never known guilt in his life because he'd never did anything to, be, to feel guilty about. He had always made the perfect decisions perfect choices and did the right thing. But in a moment on the cross, he was going to be glorified and God was going to be glorified in him. And then in verse 32, it says, if God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him. And so this act of submission from the cross where Jesus was about to go uh, was something that would bring glory and honor to Christ and to God. You know, the very fact that, that uh, anybody would lay down their life for another was a, was a great thing. Uh, generally, uh, those who have received the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor uh, in, uh, in American military uh, receive this because of... Uh, uh, sacrifice or taking humongous risks that went far beyond the call of duty uh, to save uh, their fellow combatants, their, uh, the soldiers that were serving with them. And so Jesus assumed the nature of sin for all of us and uh, uh, therefore he completed the plan of salvation. Uh, from the very beginning Jesus uh, has been declared as the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. And so the Passover feast, which was going to take place uh, the day beginning right after Jesus' death, Jesus was going to be the Paschal Lamb. He was going to be the sacrificial Lamb given as a substitute for the sins of all humanity. So in verse 33, Jesus describes his disciples who were mature men. Uh, most of them were probably older than Jesus. Uh, Jesus was about 30 when he began his public ministry, and, and uh, now he's about 33 years old. He had a three-year uh, public ministry. And um, uh, these fishermen and tax collectors and, and uh, uh, people from all walks of life that became his disciples, became part of the twelve. Um, they uh, they were probably uh, older than Jesus, and uh, an exception to that was John. John, uh, the author of, of this writing that we're studying tonight, uh, was younger than the rest of them, and um, he was going to be the only one to uh, not die a martyr's death. And we're going to look at that in just a little bit as well. So Jesus says to them, uh, little children, 
So he he's talking about their level of faith and development uh, spiritually, not physically, but spiritually. And he tells them the that uh, yet a little while I'm with you. So Jesus is now telling them, my time is short. I'm not going to be with you much longer. And of course, uh, uh, they didn't know whether this was days, weeks, or years. But Jesus was saying that I'm not always going to be here. And he says, you're going to seek me. And uh, as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, and uh, so now Jesus uh, is giving them his parting advice. He's giving them something that he wants them to recall. He's giving them a, a, a rule to live by. He says, a new commandment I give unto you. Well, the disciples were all familiar with the laws of Moses, the Ten Commandments. And Jesus now is saying, I'm going to give you a new commandment. Now, Jesus had hinted at this uh, in their presence uh, when um, a man came up to Jesus and said, uh, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, keep the commandments. And the man said, well, Lord, all of these have I observed from my youth up. And, uh, and so uh, Jesus uh, uh, asked him, he said, what sayest the the scripture. And he said, uh, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy strength. And the second is likened unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus interrupted him. He'd taken a breath and he was ready to recite the other eight commandments. And Jesus interrupted him. And he says, This do and thou shalt live. So Jesus said to them, upon this hinge all the laws and all the prophecies. That of love. First of all, a, a vertical love between you and God. And secondly, a horizontal love between you and your fellow man. It's sort of making a cross vertically. Love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so some people do not love themselves very well. Uh, and so to have an adequate kind of love, we, we need to have a sense of self-love. But beyond that, we, we're not totally uh, absorbed by the love that we feel for ourselves. But we also must love our neighbors. And uh, we must do that to the same degree that we love ourselves. So he's, here he's giving them this commandment. He says, uh, I give you the commandment that you love one another as I have loved you, that you should also love one another. So Jesus says that I've been a living example about love uh, in times where you've tested my patience and um, uh, in times where you have stumbled and fallen. Uh, whatever uh, you have done, you have felt my undergirding love. My love has not been conditional. Um, even uh, among your disobedience, even among your short-sightedness, I still love you. And this, this is a promise not only to the 12, and at this point to the 11, but uh, uh, this is a promise to us that Christ has first of all loved us, and he expects us uh, to live in that spirit of love uh, with one another. And uh, so it's uh, vitally important that this be the motivating factor in all of our lives. Uh, one of the things that uh, helps us uh, to love in a deeper way is to know each other. You know, sometimes if we, uh, uh, if we initially have met somebody, um, uh, what we feel for them may be very shallow uh, at, at those moments. But the more that we get to know people and understand especially uh, why they behave in the way that they do, then it gives us a more forgiving spirit. So uh, Jesus said, uh, 
Uh, it's important to love one another. And then he tells us in verse 35, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. And so this is not an optional thing. Uh, this is not something that we can either choose to do or, or cast by the wayside. But this is the witness and testimony to the world that we love one another. And um, so this, uh, this attracts people to Christ if they see acceptance and love and support in the fellowship of believers. Then at this point, uh, uh, Simon Peter, who uh, is always willing to speak up when he has a question, uh, in verse 36, Simon Peter uh, said unto him, Lord, whether thou goest, goest thou, Jesus answered him, Whether I go, thou shalt not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Well, uh, this uh, uh, Simon Peter had always followed Jesus. Ever since he, he met him there at, uh, at the baptism of John in the, at the Jordan River. And uh, when uh, uh, they had this encounter, uh, as uh, Peter was introduced to Jesus, by his brother, uh, Andrew, uh, he, uh, he brought his brother to Jesus and uh, they heard the teachings of Jesus and they were deeply impressed, but they went on back home for a little bit and they were fishing by the Sea of Galilee. And so Jesus goes by their little fishing village, not far from Calpurnium, and um, speaks a very short invitation to them. Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Yeah. How often have we preached a, a half an hour sermon and uh, given a passionate plea to those who were outside of the ark of safety, who were unsaved, and nothing happened. Uh, the people listened to the hymn of invitation and the words of encouragement to come forward and accept Christ, but yet didn't act upon it. But here Jesus walks by and said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Some of the most dramatic sermons have been very short sermons. Uh, there was this huge city in the Old Testament called Nineveh. And the scripture tells us that, that, that it was a three day journey through the city. That meant walking. It took three days to walk from one fringe of the city to the other. And uh, Jonah went there with a commission from God to uh, tell the people, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, there was no grace in this sermon. There was no promise of, if you do this thing, I'm going to do the other thing for you. But it was simply a message of condemnation. Yet 40 days and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. And the people were cut to the heart they were cut to the very core of their being much as these disciples were by the sea of galilee when jesus says follow me and i'll make you fishers of men these men were generations deep in the fishing profession and um, uh, so they uh, uh, their father zebedee before them was a fisherman his father before him was a fisherman that's all they knew and Jesus was saying to them, forsake what you've been doing, leave, uh, le leave what you have committed your life to, and follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And immediately the scripture tells us they forsook their nets and followed Jesus. The normal thing for fishermen when they uh, had uh, toiled all night, and that was the best time to fish uh, using trolling nets, was at night. And that was the most productive time. And so uh, when they finished up their shift by, uh, by daylight, they were worn out and they were hungry and they were tired and sleepy. But the, the thing that they did was they, uh, first of all, they washed their nets. They cleaned out all the stuff that uh, wasn't fish inside the net and they mended their nets. They got it ready for the next shift. But here when Jesus walked by and says, follow me, 
and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they forsook their nets. They left them right where they were. Nothing was more uh, pressing than the call of the kingdom to follow Jesus, to do what Jesus asked them to do. And the Ninevites, when they heard this, this message, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. They said one to the other, pray a venture. Who can say if God will turn his face from his fierce anger? In other words, let's, let's try to repent of our evil. Let's try God and, and see maybe if he will not condemn us and not destroy us. And they clothed themselves in sackcloth and ashes and they went to God in a penitent attitude. And God uh, then turned to Jonah and said, uh, go back and tell the people that the Lord has heard your voice and Nineveh will be spared. And uh, of course, we all know that uh, Nineveh, uh, that uh, Jonah pouted over this and uh, went and sat under a gourd and uh, a cutworm came along and, and cut this gourd from over him that was providing shade. And uh, so uh, he, he had a great revival and was pouting about it uh, because uh, the Ninevites had been his enemy. And uh, Jesus says, we're to love our enemies. So uh, here, uh, Simon Peter says, uh, uh, Lord, uh, why can't I follow you? And then he, he says, I will lay down my life for thy sake. You know, I'm committed to you. Lord, whatever you ask me to do, I'm going to do. Uh, it's, uh, it's easy to make these kind of decisions when we're not in the foxhole. When no danger is present, we can say, well, uh, you know, I'd give my life for the Lord. I'd give my life for my neighbor. It's sort of like uh, the situation at a, at a prayer meeting. Uh, these two guys were walking along together uh, uh, to prayer meeting. And uh, so uh, when they got to a prayer meeting uh, and the minister asked for testimonies, testimony is an opportunity to get up and talk about how God has been real in your life what the Lord has done for you. But this guy uh, sort of strayed from the intent of testimony and began to brag on himself. And he said, I just want you brothers and sisters to know that I am fearless and I'm dauntless. And furthermore, I, I'm scared of nothing. And uh, after the Bible study was over, uh, they, the two men started down the road together. And uh, as they uh, sojourned together, um, the man who uh, uh, heard his friend give this testimony said, uh, well, uh, Brother John, I, I didn't realize uh, how brave you were. And uh, John said, well, time didn't permit me to tell it all. So he had to brag a little more on himself. And about that time, he no more got the words out of his mouth than a big black bear weighing about 400 pounds rumbled out of the woods and this guy who did all the bragging and talking about how brave and and uh, dauntless and fearless he was he took off running and uh, of course the other man uh, didn't run he just picked up a big stick there and the bear was just as frightened of them as as they were of the bear and the bear took off the opposite direction and uh, the man who didn't do the bragging finally caught up with his friend and he said, uh, uh, friend, uh, what about all that bragging and everything you did back in church when you tried to give a testimony and a bear comes out and you take off and you leave me behind? And he says, brother, he says, there's a great big difference between a prayer meeting and a bear meeting. So Simon Peter was the same way. He was uh, bragging about Lord Though all forsake you, I'll lay down my life for, the, for your sake. And so Jesus tells Simon Peter uh, that uh, what he really was going to do. Jesus answered him, Will thou lay down my life for my sake? And then he answers his own question. He says, Verily, verily, 
which means truly, truly, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me three times. And uh, so Simon Peter, you know, he just uh, uh, disavows this, that, uh, that he's, that he's going to be faith, faithful regardless. But uh, within 24 hours, uh, things were not going well for the Christian movement. Jesus had been taken prisoner. Instead of standing up and giving a great witness for, uh, for uh, who he was and what he was, and why he came into the world and so forth, he spoke not a word. A prophet over 600 years before said when the Messiah comes, he would be led from judgment to judgment and he would have no witnesses on his behalf. He said there would be no one there to declare his generation. Uh, he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. And so all of Jesus's trial was described by the prophet Isaiah uh, in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah is a picture of the suffering Savior. And so during this time, some of the people, as, as they milled around and the, and the trial was going on and the Roman soldiers were warming themselves by the fire, they asked Simon Peter, are you one of his? And Simon Peter spoke up and cleared, cleared his voice and spoke up and said, uh, no, not me. Uh, I, I'm not one of his disciples. And then a little later, he uh, ran into a group of other people. and They said, uh, aren't you one of those that's been traveling around with Jesus? Did I see you about a week earlier coming in the gate when the, when the people were laying down their palm branches and, and saying, Hosanna, weren't you among that group? And Peter said, no, no, it wasn't me. And then it wasn't very much longer after that as the trial proceeded and Simon Peter was within earshot of what was going on. The person said, Art thou not from Galilee? You have that Galilean accent. Your speech betrays you. And Simon Peter cursed and swore and said, I never knew him. And about the end, the breaking of the day was happening and a cock crowed. And Simon Peter had did just as Jesus had said. He had denied Jesus three times. But Jesus was going to give him an opportunity to straighten all that out. Jesus, after the resurrection, uh, said, uh, Simon Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Simon Peter said, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. And Jesus says, Feed my sheep. And then Jesus asked him again, Simon Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And Simon Peter said, Yea, Lord, uh, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus says, Feed my lambs. And then again, the third time, Jesus asked him. And he would cut Simon Peter to the core because he knows that Jesus knows that he had denied him three times, just as Jesus had predicted. And so he says, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And again, he says, Feed my sheep. And so uh, Jesus gave him an opportunity to, to confess what he had denied earlier at the trial. When Jesus uh, came out of the court proceedings there, the scripture tells us that, that uh, uh, Jesus tenderly looked at Simon Peter. His look said to Simon Peter, I know that you failed, Simon Peter. I know that you failed three times, but it's okay. I still love you. You are my disciple. And so Jesus gives us these same words of comfort because he loves us and he has called us to be his disciples. Let us pray. God, our Father, we thank you that Jesus is always faithful. 
that uh, we can depend upon him. And irrespective of our failures in life, he beholds us and he loves us. We pray that we might not be rash in our offering of what we're willing to do because, Lord, we know that we can all fail. But it's so wonderful to know that in the midst of our failures, you're there. You're there to redeem us. You're there to forgive us of all of our sins. And you're there eventually to welcome us into your kingdom, that where you have gone, we also will be able to follow. So bless us, Lord, and be with us through this week and keep us ever focused on the most holy faith that uh, rests in you. For we ask it all in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.